Hello and welcome to this edition of Minstrels on the Block, where we bring you the finest singers and songwriters of the Valley area. Today's special guest is Miss Catherine Childry. Yes. Nice to meet you, Catherine. Nice to meet you, too. Glad to have you on the show, so tell me about it's yourself. It's good to be here. Um, my name is Catherine Childry. I've been here in the Columbus area now for probably over 25 years. Uh, love it. It's home. Where were you born? I was born in Greenville, North Carolina, actually. Very cool. Um, long, long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go into that. Exactly. Thank you very much. <laughs> I've been around the block. <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> What did your parents do? My mother, uh, she actually she retired from dry cleaning. Oh, very cool. Mm -hmm. So we never ironed a thing. Everything was brought home pressed and <laughs> ready to hang in the closet. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> now, were your parents musical at all? No, actually, my mother, uh, my oldest sister was. She was the one that actually inspired me to sing and do all that I do today, actually, uh, a lot of what I do today, as well as my chorus teacher who trained me to uh, sing classical music and opera. And uh, as a teenager, I would travel with him and the crew at the high school and sing on balconies and Italian and Spanish and different foreign languages. Wow. Um, and as I got older, you know, my sister, uh, she used to sing in nightclubs in New York. Wow. And so she would always come home, bringing all this music, you know, home with her. And, and uh, when she would go to work, she would always tell us when we were little kids, don't bother my albums. And so, of course, when she would leave, we would bother the <laughs> albums. I mean, Diana Ross, Chubby <laughs> Checker, I mean, uh, the whole nine, Nat King Cole. I mean, we knew those songs by heart, you know, literally. And uh, so I started singing. I, c I can recall when I was, what, five or six years old, uh, standing out in the yard with a water hose, singing, chain, 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 <laughs> you know. So all those songs were actually kind of what inspired me uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and kept me singing, even from a little child all the way up to when I got in elementary school and high school. And then my course teacher decided to, he wanted to train me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's where it all began. Now, how did your sister get into it? My sister's been singing all her life, actually. She started out singing in church. And, uh, and then eventually, eventually her, her gift took her to, you know, took her to New York. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, she was my inspiration. That's very, very mm -hmm. cool. Now, her singing inspired you, and then of course you have the influences of, of, mm -hmm. her, of her albums <clears throat> that you were not supposed to mess with. <laughs> <laughs> now, what made you continue on? Well, when you, as, as a singer, and I tell this to all my students, when you most of, a lot of times when you're singing, it has to be a passion on the inside of you, mm, yeah. and that's where it grows from. It, you know, and, and having a mother that supported me, she kept me even in, in school. She always had me involved in choruses. Mm -hmm. uh, once I heard my sister sing, and I would sing with her a lot of times. Actually, we had a group called the Johnson Sisters. Nice. Uh, there are three of us. My sister Brenda, who's about 11 months older than myself, and my sister Dot. Three of us. We we formed a group as young. You know, mm -hmm. when we were young. And we started singing together and traveling together and doing things. Of course, it was a church-based group. Mm -hmm. So we did things. And then as I, be as I became older and became a teenager, music always seemed to draw me. Mm -hmm. No matter where I was, when I started singing, people just wanted to hear me sing again. Mm -hmm. So opportunities began to open, you know, even as a young, a young kid to sing. And, and then I had a, uh, one of our um, choir directors at church. She started mentoring me. Mm -hmm. And she began to train me uh, to do gospel music because when I was in school, in, in, in high school, I only sang a lot of classical music. Yeah. So she pulled me in and started working with me with gospel music and then I became a choir director at my local church. So I started directing choir there, uh, working with voices. And because my voice was trained, a lot of people would always say, can you show me how to do this? Mm -hmm. And so immediately I started coaching vocals at the wow. age of you know, 15 and 16, younger kids, mentoring them and bringing them in. And then I started directing choirs and music just became a part of me. You know, everything I did from the time I was five years old until I started school in all my choruses, you know, elementary school, junior high school, still in chorus, high school, still in chorus, you know, the training, everything I think has prepared me for what I'm doing today. <clears throat> now, did you have, now, did you have, was it a, was it a, did you just have the natural gift yes. from the get go, or you didn't have to like go through a lot of like a lot of coaching or, or voice lessons or anything? Well, like that? even with the natural gift, um, and I, and it was a natural gift, uh, but even with the natural gift, there were still things that 
I learned from the vocal coaching mm -hmm. that actually equipped me to do a lot of the classical music that mm -hmm. I did. Because even growing up as a kid uh, and singing like I did, because it was, even though it was, a, it was a natural gift, the classical music taught me a lot of the technical aspects mm -hmm. of singing that I wouldn't have learned by, right, just, right. by just doing what I did. And being trained, it actually helped teach me how to train. So that's, cool. that's what is so is great about it all. Now, as far as, let's go a little bit into the classical music. Mm -hmm. um, what were there specific artists? What, like, I'm very familiar with classical music and mm -hmm. I love classical music. Uh, how, how do you use the classical music to train your voice? Well, there are certain techniques vocally that uh, kind of help launch you in the directions you need to go in with your voice. Uh, and this is what I teach my students on, on a regular basis, uh, the basic foundational principles of vocalizing, breath control, mm -hmm. you know, having the clarity of voice, uh, diction, pronunciation, enunciation, uh, uh, using your diaphragm, right, head right. and chest singing, all those things are basic foundational principles when you are vocalizing. And these are things that I learned uh, when I was trained by, by, my, uh, by, by my vocal coach, uh, Stephen Cook. And I'm sure that today he would probably be very proud to hear me because back then I was kind of the bad girl in classroom. I, <laughs> I stayed in trouble a lot doing all kind of crazy stuff. But, but still, in spite of all that, I had a voice and uh, he worked with me very, very hard to create what I am today. But um, all of the classical music that I got seeing, you know, German music, um, all kinds of just really, really cool stuff. Uh, I can recall standing on balconies in big cathedrals and wow. it, dressed in formal attire and singing in Italian and, you know, just, it was really cool. And of course, at, in school I was involved in all the, all the, the plays, you know, mm -hmm. My Fair Lady, you know, Oklahoma, uh, you know, all of the, all of the great operas that they had back then, not necessarily operas, but just school, school right. plays mm -hmm. that they had back then, which kind of, you know, equipped me and actually helped to develop, because I tell all my students, when you are being trained, you need to be using your gift. You right. need to be using it in order to, it's like buying a gun or a rifle and never ever be learning how to use it. Right, you know, what's right. the benefit? So the training actually, and the more I use my voice, the more I begin to understand the coaching and the training and how to utilize and how to turn my voice in certain ways. Of course, the old school singers like Diana Ross, they all taught me, Rufus Chaka Khan, she was my favorite. They taught me how to do the crazy roles and all the things that you do when you're singing, oh. you know, soul music. Right. So, you know, jazz, opera, classical, country. I've had to do country music, done a little bit of everything. So I teach my students, you know, not to box yourself in, but to explore all the aspects oh, yeah. of singing. Because mm -hmm. you don't want you want you don't want to limit yourself because you never know what your audience is gonna want from you. So you want to always be able to go wherever you need to go. Be prepared. Exactly. Now going back a little bit, where did you learn these other languages? Um, I said Spanish is my second language. I love language, but I, I found that you don't have to necessarily speak a foreign language to sing a foreign language. Well, that's true. Mm -hmm. I have walked around the house singing the German version of She Loves You by the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings me to the most important question of the show, Elvis or the Beatles? The Beatles. The oh, Beatles. <laughs> the Beatles. <laughs> well, the, we, we, so far, in however many episodes that this question has run, the Beatles have it. They are in the lead by quite a good bit. Yes. <laughs> so let's check out one of Catherine's songs. We'll be right back after this. Hi, I'm Catherine Childry. I'm going to sing a song entitled Your Masterpiece. Your Masterpiece is a wonderful musical uh, story about the crucifixion of Christ and how that actual crucifixion was God's masterpiece. This piece is by Ashmont Hill. Enjoy.
Hello and welcome back to this edition of Minstrels on the Block. Special guest, Catherine Childry. So Catherine, tell me a little bit leading up to and what you've got going on now. Well, right now, Brian, I, um, I work full-time uh, at North Highland Church mm -hmm. as a music assistant and as an uh, assistant to the church administrator, which is what my area of degree is. Mm -hmm. uh, even though I'm a vocalist and even though I work with vocals, vocals, uh, vocalists myself, um, my degree is in business administration. Mm -hmm. That's another area that I'm very passionate and I love working, I, I love working in. So I assist um, the church administrator at North Highland in running the place and doing what I need to do with the networking and the um, uh, you know, music with the uh, music, music pastor there. But also, I own my own business. I mm -hmm. uh, have a vocal studio up in North Columbus off of Double Church's Road yeah. called Let's Vocalize. Uh, because I started working with mm -hmm. students and because my singing and uh, my gift of vocalizing had a lot of people asking me, can you help me? Right. It kind of spurred in me a passion to just, because I did it for so many years. Right. I, I, I just knew that it was what I needed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And so I would have kids coming into my home, uh, working with them, teaching them, and training them how to execute certain vocal styles and, uh, and teaching them to prepare them for pageants and um, you know, fine arts competitions, which I am a judge of a state competition I have been now for about 15 years, a statewide fine arts competition where I judge vocalists and help them and train them, help them to get ready for the, uh, for the festival. That's cool. Uh, when I started doing that, after I started doing it out of my home for about 10 years, mm -hmm. I decided maybe it's time to, to, to go into that. Mm -hmm. um, so an opportunity op opened itself for me to get a small studio over on Warm Springs Road about, about uh, six years ago, mm -hmm. uh, and I opened that one-room studio, uh, and I started training vocalists. And I and actually I worked for the Shorb School of Music for a little while, but I was wow. just I was there as a secretary. But I got a chance to do some vocal things while I was there too. But then I I worked for the Greater Columbus School of Music, training uh, teaching voice there wow. for a little while. Um, and once I started teaching voice there, the students that came in that I was training, they just they started asking me, "Can you come to my church and mm -hmm. work with my choir?" which was something that I've always done also, you know, work with choirs, because uh, I started directing choirs at the age of 18. So um, I started uh, going to their churches, and then another door opened for me to go to another church. Yeah. And so the students that I had at, at the studio actually invited me into their churches, and so that opened up an opportunity for me to exercise another area that I'm very passionate about, and that is directing choirs and uh, directing large groups. So I started doing that, and so many doors opened open up for me. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact on, one, on, on one Saturday, I'd had three churches that I'd visit, you know, 10 o'clock and at 12 o'clock and at 2 o'clock. So the opportunities began to avail themselves to me to just, I mean, to just do it. Mm -hmm. And I, I was passionate about it. I loved it. And more people wanted me to come. And so that's when I moved into a larger studio. I just moved into the studio over on Bascom Court um, last summer, actually, 2011, uh, June 2011 beautiful three office suite where I have my work room and my back office and my front reception office and bathroom and everything and it's been I've been there now for 18 months and everything's going great I've got a full roster of students great. Um, I, I, of course I still at church during the day but in the evenings I'm there from 6 to 9 um, Monday through Friday and Friday from 5 to 9 and on Saturdays I'm there for eight hours from like 12 to 8 o'clock at night just coaching one-on-one -on -one private vocals. And when I have a workshop, I generally reschedule my vocals and I'll travel out of town. I've had, uh, done them in Birmingham, Alabama, Huntsville, Alabama. I've got one in Manchester here in a few weeks, one in Talbotton, and different churches invited me to come in and train their choirs wow. and teach them. Uh, so it's exciting. I love what I do. I'm passionate about it. And um, I try to be one of those who, uh, what, what they say, um, do as I do and not as I say. Yeah. So because I try to keep my voice itself trained so that when I show people how to do it, mm -hmm. I can actually do it myself. So I try to walk in it myself, you know. Right. Which is very important. Yes, it is. Major. That's very cool. And, and it's obvious that, that you are definitely doing something that you are meant to do yes. for it to, yes. to yes. just yes. blossom yes. like that. Yes. Now, <clears throat> where would you like to go with everything that you've got going on? Where would you like to see yourself in, say, 10 years? In 10 years, I would love to be doing this on a full-time basis um, because I am a speaker also, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I am a licensed uh, minister. Uh, I have a lot of churches that invite me to come and speak because mm -hmm. my, uh, my workshops are so intense. And when I get involved in training, I, I mean, it's not just about developing the voice for me. 
Right. It's about developing the whole person. Mm -hmm. um, attitude. Uh, I tell a lot of my students, and I tell a lot of the people in the churches that I go to and the choirs that I work with, that nobody wants to hear a singer with a bad attitude. True. You know, uh, you want to. So in my studio, I work towards developing the whole person. A lot, a lot of my students, I mentor and I. Uh, not just train them vocally, but I mentor them. I, I'm in contact with the school teachers mm -hmm. to help them with uh, Allstate. If I have students in my studio that are involved in Allstate chorus mm -hmm. and there are certain requirements that they need to meet, then I contact the teacher and say, I have got one of your students in my studio, and what do I need to do on my end to help them to become better at what they're doing? Uh, mm -hmm. I want them to not just be good at vocalizing, I want them to be good at the, in attitude-wise. And I've got parents that uh, I've got a little ten-year-old. Her mother brought her in to me. And she said, "I want her mentored, not just. I mean, I just want. I don't want her to just be trained to sing." And she said, "I like what I see you're doing. You're doing more than just training her to sing. You're training her to be a a wonderful young woman mm -hmm. in her character, in the way she carries herself, yeah. in the way she." Even her diction, because diction is so important with me, and uh, enunciating, I, and, and I tell all my kids, I say, you know, this is, you've got an audience out there that may not always hear you with their ears. Right. Many of them are hearing impaired, uh, and they have to hear you with their eyes. They, ha they have to, so you have to be careful how you form your words, you know, your pronunciation, enunciation, because uh, people that can't hear with their ears, they watch what you say. Yeah. And so, you know, all of these all of these kind of culminate into developing the whole person. When I go to churches, I try to make it humorous and by, by talking to them and telling them, you know, the funny things that I've gone through over the years that I've been working with choirs and the, the trips on the stage and over the microphone cord and all these things <laughs> that, you, you know, that, you, that you just experience with life um, and helping them make the workshops a lot more humorous. As a matter of fact, I, when I did one in Oasis over in Phoenix City uh, a few years back, the lady, she laughed so hard, she just says, Miss Children, please stop because you, <laughs> uh, you are so funny. You need to be a comedian. But I feel like humor lightens the audience. It lightens it, everything, so it won't be so stiff and so tight, you know. Yeah. Because I love to laugh, and it's all, all that's a part of, of working with vocalists is just teaching them all the way around, you know. Mm. So it's good. And there's no fun working with someone who is humorless. Uh, humor yeah. is an integral yeah. part of of the human being. So uh, I, I think far too often there is teaching without humor, and I, yes. I think what you're doing is very good. Yes. Yes. Now. Let's just say you're walking around the house on a, your day off. Mm -hmm. What are you most likely to be listening to in your music deploying device? <laughs> in my music deploying device, he says, okay. <laughs> interesting, oh, interesting take of words, right? Um, in my, I, I love ballads, um, yeah. easy listening uh, music. Uh, classical. I love. I love classical. I have my whole collection of classical music that I listen to. But most of what I listen to is a lot, I listen to a lot of contemporary gospel. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I've had people that that tell me you don't sing like a black woman. <laughs> I'm like, how does a black woman sing? You know, um, because I'm trained, I try to walk in that and practice that. And whatever wow. I do, and I, I found out that a lot of the black gospel music, although I can sing it and I do sing it, it will tear your vocal cords all to pieces. It oh. stretches you vocally. And but you know, I do sing it, but I ha I know whether I have to learn where to draw the line. Uh, yeah. You know, and so I try to stay uh, in the music genre or the area on a regular basis that actually accentuates my voice and helps to make me a stronger vocalist at what I do. But I do love contemporary gospel and easy listening, classical music, you know. One thing I'd like to go back to, we've talked a lot about classical music on, mm -hmm. on this episode, and, and I've, I have, I don't know, sometime in my teens I love, I fell in love with classical music. Mm -hmm. And the neat thing about classical is there's, there's so much stuff going on that you can close your eyes and you can yes. almost see the sounds, exactly. all the little different aspects. Yes. What, and this goes actually back to the beginning of the show, but mm -hmm. what set you on fire for classical music? I think it was my chorus instructor when I was in school. Um, a lot of things that we did uh, actually kind of made me, draw, drew me toward that particular type of music. It's a very relaxing mm -hmm. music, um, but it requires a lot vocally when you are performing classical music mm -hmm. because you can't just open your mouth and sing. You right. have to think. Mm -hmm. You have to think about 
what direction I'm throwing my voice. You have to think about breath control. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that because people that sing classical music, they're so starched and stiff. Oh, you know, oh, oh. exactly. <laughs> and, I, and I tell my students, I said, I'm, I teach you the foundation using classical music mm -hmm. because not only does it teach you how to carry yourself when you're singing, but a lot of the techniques that they use, open throat, um, sound, it actually gives you the depth of voice that you need when you are vocalizing. And not only is that good for just classical music, but it carries you into gospel music. Mm -hmm. It carries you into country music, whatever style of music you sing. But it's the basic foundational principles of vocalizing that you learn in classical music that you, you're not taught mm -hmm. in the other genres of music. And so I use that as my foundation, not only to teach my kids how to actually carry themselves on stage, but I want them to learn a stage presence. I want them to learn how do you sit, how do you both feet on the floor, back straight, you know, using your upper and lower register, using your diaphragm, you know, mm -hmm. the breathing processes, all those things you're not taught when you sing gospel music, you're not taught when you sing uh, jazz, right. but when you are trained to sing classical, you learn those foundations, mm -hmm. you know, as, as a classical singer. Very cool. Classical is awesome. It and, is. Uh, tell you what, let's check out another of Catherine's songs. We'll be right back after this. This next song is has been written and arranged by and recorded by Carrie Job. It's called You Are Good. One of the things I love about this song is it talks about the goodness of God, the mercy of God, and the kindness of God, and how that goodness, mercy, and kindness has led us all to change the way that we choose to live our lives. And um, it's a great song, and I hope you enjoy it. You are good. Oh 
is forever. Your goodness is forever. Your mercy is forever, forever. Lord, your kindness is forever. Your goodness is forever. Your mercy is forever, forever. Oh, your kindness is forever. Your goodness is forever. Your mercy is forever. Hello, my name is Stephen Gregg and I'm the pastor of Trinity United Methodist Church. I'd love for you to tune in to a daily broadcast called Pastor's Pulse Point. It's a devotional moment that lasts about 10 minutes, a great way to start your day in God's Word. It's on Channel 7 at 8 and 9 o'clock in the morning. Tune in. Hello and welcome back to this edition of Minstrels on the Block, where we bring you the finest singers and songwriters of the Valley area. Today's special guest, ca guest Catherine Childry, if I could learn to speak. <laughs> this is the part of the show enunciate. where we enunciate, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is the part of the show where we pimp stuff. So, what is it do you have that you want everybody out there in TV land to know about? Well, I would, I would be uh, uh, honored to, uh, to talk about my studio. Uh, the Let's Vocalize Studio Voice, uh, located on Bascom Court here in, in North Columbus. I've, uh, it's a studio that I own and operate six days a week, actually five days a week. I do, I do take one, two days for myself. Um, and uh, that studio is uh, available and it's open. I'm actually in my workshop season right now where I'm doing vocal workshops at local organizations and churches, locally and out of town as a matter of fact. And uh, that's, that's what, what I'm passionate about. Excellent. Now, there's a couple of questions I'd like to ask. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it varies for the type of guest or the, the, the faction of music that my guest is in. Um, but what do you think of the local music scene in the Valley area? Well, the Valley's got a lot to offer. Um, we don't have as many uh, instructors, or unless you're in college, mm -hmm. you don't have as many opportunities for training as I think we need. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and anybody can open their mouth and sing. Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, you might not come out with, you might not have the best sound, but you know, you can. <laughs> I've actually had people that call me and say, Miss Childry, uh, you know, I have never sang and I've had throat surgery. Can you help me sing? I said, mm, probably not because I'm not God. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I said, with all due respect, I, I can't give you what you don't have. You know, yeah. you give me something to work with and I can help you to enhance <laughs> it, but I need something to work with, you know. <laughs> but um, as far as the different, uh, what the Valley has to offer, um, I'm not out there enough to know all that's going on. Mm -hmm. um, I know uh, the downtown scene has a lot yeah. going on. Because the, number one, the Schwab School of Music moved down there and they've got a lot of their students that are kind of walking the streets and so you probably hear singers everywhere. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, I'm not very familiar with the different styles of music that they are, that is going on around here. Well, um, in the, in the, like you, you sing in church, you, mm -hmm. you do like, so what do you think of the church music scene? Not necessarily the indie or whatever. Well, the church music scene, a lot of it's moving to contemporary. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that a lot of the churches have 
no, no longer have choirs. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are going to worship bands, worship teams. Ours, uh, for example, uh, our choir has actually, we're only singing two Sundays out of the month now, and now we have a worship, uh, worship choir. But we're going, they're, they're going, even our music style is going toward more contemporary type mm -hmm. of music. You don't hear, unless you go to um, uh, a black Baptist church or a black, or, or, or black Pentecostal church, you don't hear a lot of that gospel music that you right, used to hear. Yeah. And even some of those churches are starting to sing more of the contemporary type of worship uh, mm -hmm. because it's, it's, it's what's going now. You know, and sometimes you have to kind of get on board with it to move with yeah. it, you know. How do you think that particular scene could be improved? Or what um, would you like to see happen? I'd like to see, I know that because of the different generations you have, you've got the older generation mm -hmm. and you've got the middle agers and you've got, you know, the 30s, the 20s and 30s and you've got those are teens. You have such a big gap in between the different styles um, of music is one thing why I love it. North Highland, we do we try to accommodate all of the different vocal styles. Mm -hmm. We try to, I mean, the different ages. We sing the the hymns for the Baptists. We sing the. We even have a Hispanic Hispanic uh, uh, congregation. We sing in songs in Spanish. We sing. We've got the Koreans coming in. We've seen, we try to sing music that would actually, you know, uh, yeah. encourage every age group. Mm -hmm. But I think the younger uh, generation has not heard a lot of the music that I've heard, right. uh, and they tend to not really want to hear it because they feel like it's that's old school. We don't want to hear that. You know, that's, that's like my grandma's music. <laughs> but grandma's music is what helped bring you here, you know, yeah. and that's what I, I generally say. But um, uh, a lot of the music uh, is leaning toward the contemporary, and the older people are trying to understand that. They're, they're going along with it because they kind of have no choice. Yeah. You know, I've been in church <laughs> for like 50 years, and so I kind of got to go with it or just leave. Uh, and so... You, you, you have uh, the younger people that don't understand the older music and the older people don't understand the younger music. And those of us that are kind of caught in the middle, you just kind of either listen to the older or the younger, whichever ones. Yeah. And all my kids, all my boys, uh, they grew up in, in, in this generation. So I try to be more uh, tolerant and to work with the music because I have to train a lot of this generation's vocalists. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to just say, no, I don't do that. Right. You know? So I try to make myself open as personally open to all of it. Now, like back in the day, you know, you, like today you have the generations, you have the, the, the grandmothers, the, yes. the parents, and then the, the children, uh, they all have, but you know, if you go back 50 years, mm -hmm. the, the three different generations still had the same kind of yes, music. They did. So it's like, this is the first time yeah. when gospel music or choir music has gone out the window in favor of a new type of I music. I know. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you think, uh, do you think that it is, uh, and you touched on it just now, mm -hmm. the style of, of singing or the, the, the real, the vocal training for the, the classical, the, mm -hmm. the, the real singing, how do you think that that fits in contemporary gospel music? I would say that it fits in that those basic foundational principles, they apply to all styles of mm -hmm. music because you're learning how to carry your voice. Right. You're learning how to address health issues. I mean, issues you may have with your throat and things like that that you're taught, that yeah. I teach my students. I'm big on vocal health care yeah. because I feel like if you take care of your instrument, and I call the voice an instrument because it is my oh, instrument. Yeah. Uh, I just happen to carry it everywhere I go. And a lot of times as vocalists, you take that for granted because I talk, I eat with it, I sing with it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's no big deal. It's just my voice. But, and I, I tell all my students, musicians, they they take care of their instruments. Mm -hmm. A trumpet, a trumpeter, uh, he, he's gonna clean the spit out of his trumpet. Uh, people that play the clarinet, they're gonna change those reeds out. Mm -hmm. So they, but they they don't carry those instruments with them. But because I carry my instrument with me, why should I neglect it? Right. Uh, and if you take care of it, so those those principles that you learn in classical music, they apply to all as far mm -hmm. as helping you carry your voice, right, you know, right. mm -hmm. and whether you're singing contemporary, whether you're singing black gospel, whether you're singing gospel, whether you're singing jazz, those same principles that you learn in vocal health care and in breathing from the diaphragm and head and chest singing uh, and, and how, to, how to place your voice, you know, vocal placement, those same um, techniques, they apply to any genre right. of music, you know. It's just learning how to do it and doing it right. One last question before we, we go to another of your songs. What advice, and you're, you're, you're a teacher, so this is, this is fan, a great opportunity for this. Out there in the, in the audience is 
maybe aspiring artists, people who maybe haven't got out there and done it yet, or just getting started, or thinking about it, what advice would you give to aspiring artists watching this show? I would say, regardless to how young or how old you are, um, never give up on your gift. Uh, if you are gifted, you were gifted from the time you were born. Uh, and, and you may not have had the opportunities because of employment or because of work or because of raising a family um, and not being able to actually exercise your vocal gift the way you've always wanted to. But the gift is always there. It may not be as strong as it needs to be, but with training, it can be strengthened. And, and with uh, the opportunities to perform, uh, that gift can be made stronger and stronger, you develop a stage presence, you grow, you become the vocalist that you may have always wanted to be. And that can be begin at the age of 60. I've got a student that's 56, and she's never sang before, but she had, you know, she's a voice. She had a voice, and she became a doctor. She went to college. She got her degree, in, a medical degree. She's a doctor at Fort Benning. But she's decided at the age of 56 she wants to come back and be trained. So I say it's never too late to, to um, walk into the area that you're gifted to walk into. It's just a matter of knowing who to contact and getting in contact with that person and you know, being trained. Even at the age of 50 or 60, you can still be trained to sing and, and sing well. Very cool. Well, Catherine, I appreciate you coming on the show. Lots of good information. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. It's my pleasure. I hope you've enjoyed this edition of Minstrels on the Block with Catherine Childry. Have you got a lot out of it? Because there's a lot to get out of this episode. Definitely. I'm your host, Brian Mallard, and we'll see you next time on CTVEA. This song is called Mystery. It is recorded in, uh, by Gateway Church, uh, and the young lady singing it is Carrie Job. But the wonderful thing I love about this song is it talks about the mystery of God and how phenomenal he is and how he came to earth as a human, but yet he was so splendid. And it talks about his amazing love to us, uh, even when we don't love ourselves. And so it's a great song, and I hope that you enjoy it. It's called Mystery. Mystery is you.